Here we are, Mr. Andre Duclair. Welcome to the Brooklyn Boardroom, brother. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the time. Appreciate that. Yeah, listen, man, we, we, we know you high price lawyers, you know, you, every minute counts. So I it does. It. <laughs> like I, he wasn't even like, oh, no, no, not like that. He's like, yeah, no, yeah, I got you on the clock right now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, it's all good. Listen, man, game, respect, game. I, I respect that. You know what I mean? You've got a lot of books in the background to deal with right now. So a lot of cases, a lot of cases. So we're going to jump right into it real quick just to set you up properly. So Andre Duclair, licensed attorney former a prosecutor out of Philadelphia, practices in both Jersey and Philly, but, um, and is from, you're from Queens originally, right? Queens, yeah. yeah Queens. But you, you, you've handled, you know, all kind of criminal cases involving federal charges, state charges, grant, you know, larceny, you know, assault, robbery. Oh, you've seen yep. it all, right? I, I've seen too many, too much. I mean, have you dealt with any murder? Any murder oh, crime? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, got it. So, oh, oh yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Oh, oh yeah. So we talking to the right brother. See, I, you know, you, 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 you have eclipsed me by many years of experience. Although I am a lawyer as well, and I also was a prosecutor. You know, I was there for even shorter than you were in terms of your tenure as a prosecutor. <laughs> you know, like you said, it's it's about the coins, man. And at the end of the day, you know, what what good is a job if you can't pay your bills, right? So correct, correct. You know I mean? And that's all of the conversation about working for the for state. For the for for the state and for government in terms of what what they offer. But anyway, so jumping on to the conversation. Listen, this is all about my man casting over two times, right? So actually, Cas and I share a couple of things in our pedigree that's similar. I also was a, a former resident of Flatbush, East Flatbush, Brooklyn, and I know the area very well. Grew up over there a part of my life as well as other areas. So, um, but things have changed a lot since I was growing up in in Flatbush. I don't think the Bloods were active at the time when I was in my teens, definitely not the way things are taking over now. So, and I, I think he claims blood. I don't think that's like an alleged relationship. I think he's a legitimate blood gang member, right? Now, whether now how what we describe as gang is another matter. So anyway, let's just jump right in. So this 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 episode of Brooklyn Ballroom is all about how to beat the charge, right? So we, we wanted for how to beat the charge, right? So as you may, may be aware, he was recently picked up um, on a federal indictment. I think it was maybe 18 counts. And it includes things like, in my notes here, it includes things like um, racketeering, distributing uh, controlled substances, and possession of a firearm and further of, a, of, drug, of drug trafficking crime. So, but before we get into that, let's just break down what happens to someone in his predicament um, from a legal perspective, and what are their alternatives, right? So let's 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 press let's press reset on the clock. Casting over two times is your client. You all of a sudden get a text from him, and he and he's on the run. The feds are looking for him, and he's decided to, you know, evade. I don't even know if they were like hunting him down, or but he's just he hasn't turned himself in. What if what's the first thing you say to him when he calls you up? Um, the first thing I, I tell him is, where are you? Don't move. We're going to turn yourself in. And that's because you're not running anywhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know where you think you're going to go, yeah. but wherever you think you're going to go, they will get you. So let they're me make gonna, it. They're not coming to Tijuana, to Mexico for no cast number two times. Well, yes, they are. It's eventually, eventually, it'll come down. Listen, oh, really? they, they, first of all, you have no connections in Tijuana, Mexico. And even if you did, even if you did, they will come get you. So you're not, you're, you're, you're not untouchable. So where are you? Let me call the feds, the FBI right now. Let me call, let me call what they call the AUSA, the, the federal government, the federal prosecutor. Let me call him. He's going to put me in touch with the FBI. And we're going to figure out how to turn, how and when to turn you in. Really, when to turn you in. Bottom line, you're not running anywhere. Now, in that same breath, I'm going to say, like most defense attorneys say, do not speak to anyone else on the phone. Do not communicate to anyone, anyone, anyone else on the phone. That's because I don't want your... Your phone, see, when you hit a federal indictment, nine times out of 10, your phone's already tapped. Mm -hmm. nine, nine, nine and a half times out of 10, they're already tapping your girlfriend's phone, your mama's phone, everyone else's phone. Mm -hmm. So stop calling people and, and divulge the information. Just stop. Okay. The reason the reason you're in trouble now is because you divulge too many information. So I just know. let me call them. We're going to get you. We're, we're going to get you. We're going to turn yourself in nice and easy. So just shut up and, and, and take the advice of your counsel. Okay, so let me ask you this. So you, the second phone call you get is his baby mother, his mama, his grandmama, his homie. 
hey, look, you know, uh, Mrs. Duclair, you know, I'm not sure what to do. You know, I, I just, Cass was over here two nights ago and I, I don't know what to do. He has been in contact with me. I know you represent him. What should I do? What's your advice to that person? You don't do anything. You have not been charged and stop talking on the phone. You haven't done anything. As far as you know, you haven't seen him in a couple of days, which is a good thing because I don't want them not to charge you with harboring a fugitive. Okay. So you don't talk on the phone. No. Your conversations on the phone are, are non-existent. If you want to talk to someone in person, right? I'm not. So I'm not telling you to commit a crime. I'm just telling you I'm talking on the phone. And if 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 Cass does call you, you tell him what I'm going to tell him. Turn himself in. Simple as that. Well, let me, I've heard it said. Oh, we've heard it said in in the street. Not that I'll be in the street these days, but that you don't <laughs> you don't save any. Well, you know that's for another another episode. Yeah. You know, I got I got to do what I got to do. You know what I'm <laughs> but that's the but I'm, anyway. So just teasing. But um, we've heard it said that you don't save. You don't get any less time for turning yourself in. So my question to you is: He exacerbating the outcome of his charges because he was evading the FBI. Yeah. Here's what happens. When you go before a detention hearing, because you want to get bail, right? And if you've been on the run, because they're going to, listen, let's start with the premise, they're going to catch you. Mm -hmm. The second premise is, okay, I want to get out. If they catch me, I want to be processed. I want to be processed. From the book, fingerprinted, mugshot, go down. And then my lawyer is going to ask for bail. Mm -hmm. Reasonable bail so I can get out in the streets and be with my loved ones. Mm -hmm. If you're on the run for a, for a significant amount of time, there's no more bail. What's significant? So what? So what is that wiggle room? Is it two weeks? You good? Is no. it three, three months? You you know what's the? Threshold? Well, there's no there's no fine line time frame. But I tell you one thing for certain. Yeah. If you know if, if you know and everybody knows you know federal indictment hit or state indictment hit, mm -hmm. and they're looking for you, they know they know that you know you they're looking for you by virtue of word word on the streets. Right, everybody knows words in the street, so they know they're looking for you. So within 24 to 48 hours, if you don't turn yourself in, that's a problem. Got that's it. why I say, with as soon as you know, so let's say you know on Monday, you call your, your attorney Monday afternoon, Monday evening, and you can't tell me you don't know because the, the streets, the streets talk, so you know. Mm -hmm. All your boys have been picked up, you know that you're, you're down the pike. You call your attorney that evening. Your attorney now calls the, the opposing counsel or the feds, mm -hmm. say, listen. My client wants to turn himself in. Give, give me two days to turn himself in. We're not going to give you a week. They're not going to give you a week. Give me two days to turn myself in. Why? Because the next question from them is why? Well, the answer is he wants to get his affairs in order. Got it, got it. He wants two days, 48 hours, turn himself in. Let's pick a date and time, turn himself in. They usually don't disagree with that. Handling your business. I hear that. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so let me ask you this. So now, fast forward, he's in custody. Let's say he got he was he was apprehended or whatever. He's in custody, you know, you get the phone call from him or you go down to wherever they're holding him, you know, and he, you know, he's running down with you, basically everything that happened. What's your first piece of, what's your first piece of advice to your client, Kazan, over two times, who now is in custody uh, and, and is, is facing, you know, um, uh, an, uh, uh, grand jury? Yeah, well, he got to be facing a grand jury or facing a, a, a detention hearing. Yeah. A bail hearing. Um, the number one rule is you do not talk about your case with anyone in custody with you because no one can help you but me. You don't call your mother, your si if you call your mother, your sister, your brother, your uncle, and you don't talk about your case at all. Because, none because those phone calls are being recorded. Oh, they tell you your phone call is being recorded. I can't tell you how many times I've had clients still talk on the phone, still say some things, and they say, well, I, Mr. Duclair, I talked in code. What's wrong with code? <laughs> you think they don't understand code? No, pig Latin, pig Latin. But you know, <laughs> we, 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 we talk in pig Latin, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah don't no. talk at all. Do not say anything. Your phone calls are being recorded, and any inmate you talk to, remember, is either facing, this is survival. When you're in jail, you're in survival mode. Yeah, yeah. Everyone is throwing everyone in front of the bus because everyone wants to get out. So if they can use what you said, you, you can, it doesn't matter what you said. They'll embellish mm -hmm. on what you said in order to go down to the, to the FBI agent, uh, send him a letter, say, hey, listen, he told me X, Y, Z, one, two, three. Can you get me out? So yeah. don't talk. So, 
So while awaiting the bail hearing, while awaiting the grand jury, while awaiting the whatever here, do not speak to anyone about your case, your celly, your moms, anyone, COs, police officers, no one, no one can help you. There's nothing good that will come out of that conversation at all. Absolutely nothing. In fact, if you talk to COs, they are, they are also sworn officers of the court. So if you tell them something and they think, and they think it's important for the furtherance of justice, they will go out and tell the, the, the FBI agent, which in turn, turn to, which in turn will tell the um, system prosecutor. Well, we know snitching is a, is a full-time job these days. You know what I mean? Whether, whether you wear a law enforcement uh, suit or you were a criminal. So let me ask you this. So I think, you know, conventional wisdom of the generation that we're talking about might be, okay, I'm, you know, I'm awaiting this hearing, you know, but my people out there on the street, they, they're going to protect and preserve my good name. Right. They know I wasn't involved in this. I'm a good guy. So what about this idea? You know, Mr. Duclair, Counselor Duclair, I'm going to have my mans in them get on my Instagram account <laughs> and Twitter account, post and tweet, you know, free cast two times. Also post and tweet, you know, the fact that I'm innocent and this is an injustice and maybe promote my nonprofit maybe promote my community service, just promote the good, the good stand up man that I am. That can't be harmful, can it? Well, let me say this. If, 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 if your man in them wants to do that, they should run it past their lawyer because, you know, you're not an attorney. You don't know what they're looking for. You don't know how. You ever see people when they interview on TV with their attorney sitting right next to them? There's, there's a reason for that. Yeah, yeah. I don't want you to say anything that may incriminate you. So therefore, yeah, yeah. before your man in them, who are not very swift, not very savvy, start putting something on social media and the post, you may want to give it to your attorney first so he can look it over to tell you, to give you the nod of approval or nod of disapproval. Got Don't it, do it. Got it, got it. Okay, so this is helpful though. So it's not like there's a black and white prohibition against using these resources, just vet it through proper counsel so you don't do yourself dirty and put yourself in a worse predicament, right? Absolutely. Okay. So Absolutely, vet, vet everybody. Okay, so here's what happens next. So Kaz is, 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 is awaiting you know, we're, we're in a pretrial phase. He's, he's been indicted. You know what I mean? We're just kind of waiting for that hearing or waiting to get, well, waiting for the trial to come up. And he has a good idea. He says, you know what? I, this is obviously fictitious, but he says to himself, yeah, I did the crime. I'm going to have to do the time. Let me offer the state something or someone else to mitigate or to lessen my situation, right? We, 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 we haven't, they haven't presented their case yet, but maybe this is a good time to preempt what could happen down the road. So what is the idea? How does that feel where he comes to you and says, hey, look, I got something on, on my dude over here. There's, there's, there's a body I know about. There, there, there's a drug ring I know about. There's a, there's a rape I know about. That, and these people are bigger than me. How, can I, what, what you, Mrs. Duclair, should I give them up and maybe I can get something shaved off my sentence? Like, so what do, you, what do you tell them in that situation? Well, you know, I, there, there are two answers to that question. The first answer is a legal question, which is if you have something that can shave some time so you can get back home to your mother, to your loved ones, mm -hmm. yes. Let's tell me what you got. I'll talk to the uh, federal prosecutor. We can try to work something out. That's the, that's the legal aspect. But now you have what I call the more practical aspect is you live this life. You live this life. And let me tell you something. There are some real monsters out there. Do you want to not be labeled as a snitch? And can you take the repercussions of that, mm -hmm. right? Because remember, when, when, when you get released from prison, it's not like you're going to get released to, to Beverly Hills. You're going to get released back to your old neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you deal with the, the consequences and repercussions that come with that? And what comes with that sometimes is flat out murder. You can get killed. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not endorsing you not to tell yeah. me about a crime that could potentially an unsolved crime that could help that only helps you out, it helps the victim of that of that previous crime. But just be aware of the consequences of your actions. Well, two questions. One is if if I'm not concerned about the outcome and the consequences, is that the right time to do it before we go to trial? Is that the right time to properly? No, no. You you want to do that. If you want to negotiate something, you got something, you want to come out in early head on. So as soon as you get arrested, as soon as you're booked, and as soon as you're denied any bail or reasonable bail that you can afford, 
You want to start tell, telling me something that you want to give up somebody and know they shave off some time. Guys, not before. So, no. spill the tea is early. If you go to snitch, snitch out the gate. Don't wait till they get their pretrial discovery. Don't wait till they get to the trial phase because you may have lost that opportunity based on what you're saying. Yeah, you listen. You look, they may not be one to negotiate with you no more. You see, I mean, you can get discoveries. I encourage people to get discovery first. Get the paperwork that says your involvement in this particular indictment. Get it first. After you've gotten it, you sit down, you digest it. You and I talk about it. We digest it. You give it some thought. You come back to me later on and say the following. Listen, I think they got me. Um, you think there's something that can work out. My next question is, well, listen, you know how this game is. Um, this is the gimme game. What do you have to give me in order for them, for them to give you? Mm. So if you give me some, some good leads, and so, and now that usually requires testimony. Mm. So you're not, you're not going to just give me a lead and then you're not testifying to it. You may have to testify to that. Well, that gets my second question, which is basically, is there not a scenario where me casting over two times can snitch on the whole guerrilla, you know, gang, and 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 that the fact that I did that remain a sealed, undisclosed testimony. There's no scenario where I can snitch and not be put out there as a snitch. Well, it's very slim. I mean, I have, I have clients now who say the same thing. Can I talk without having my co-defendants know who I am? What are their names? I think brothers on the street may want to know who these people are. Who, who are we talking about? Who are you talking oh, no, about? No, no, no. Can't even go on the south side of Joe. Who you talking about? Bro? Who you talking nah, about? I mean, can't tell you. Acquiring minds want to know, brother. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure they do. Put some money on their head, right? <laughs> you know, that, 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 that's the problem. Money gets yeah, on no. their heads. No, boy, I'm just teasing. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I understand. No, see, is there, is, is there a scenario? Sure there is. But what happens is it will get redacted, meaning the name will get crossed out. But yeah. if that person, so say, for example, I decide to snitch on Chris Hamilton, right? Yeah. Great. Yeah. My name now will be redacted from the discovery documents. But Chris says, I'm going to trial. I want, I want what the expression suited and booted. I'm yeah. ready to go. Pick 12, I'm ready to go. Well, now my name will have to be released because as Chris's attorney, I'm going to say, well, I'm entitled to know who's cooperating against my client. Um, that's called the Sixth Amendment. I got to know, I got a right to confront my accuser. That's I got to know who the hell they are because I have to be able to cross examine them. I want to know. So just so if you're like, imagine if you will, if you're just sitting in a jury box hearing testimony, hearing, okay, XYZ is saying something about Chris Hamilton. XYZ is saying something about Chris Hamilton. As a juror, you say, well, who's XYZ? Mm -hmm. Bring them in the stand. Let me hear them testify. Let me see mm -hmm. if they're credible or not. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. So, yeah, so so eventually at the end of the day, sure, in the beginning, the name won't be there, but towards the end. If that person wants to, if Chris Hamilton says, I want to go to trial, well, Chris, Hamilton's a, Chris Hamilton is entitled to know who's saying what about him. Because his attorney now is entitled to say, I'm, I have to cross-examine him. So the, whole, the best you can hope for is protective, not protective, uh, witness protection. But if you're a big rapper, that's not going to work for you. You, you know what I mean? You need your publicity, right? OK, OK, we will, we, this is really helpful information. OK, so let's flip down to the next level of this conversation, which is, you know, we, 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 we in trial, you know, Kaz didn't give up anybody. He's a, he's standing on his square. He's a stand up dude. He's not going to do that. He's in his trial. And all of a sudden you come to find out through pre-trial discovery, through conversations with the prosecutors that they plan to introduce his music, his social media, his trolling, his tweets, his uh -huh. videos, you know, and you're like, what? And he's like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm an artist. That's my art. That's not who I am. How can they talk? If I talk about body in, a body in the trunk in my music, if I talk about poking a dude in, in my cell, if I talk about, you know, racket to whatever, that seems unfair. How could you use that again? That's just art. That's just art. Art imitates life. They're going to say art imitates life. And, and he's, they're going to put a link. They're going to link up. See, just saying it doesn't do anything. But remember, he he the allegation are part are the allegations that he part of the guerrilla nation, right? Yeah. Okay, fine. Well, I'm sure they've gotten some videotape. I'm sure they've gotten some people who are gonna testify and say, yeah, he here are some of the shooting, here are some of the stabbings. And by him portraying that role, because he listen, is it is it art? Sure, it's art. 
a lot, there are a lot of rappers out there who don't really don't do what they say they do on TV, on video. But there are a few that do. And they will just say, okay, well, listen, here it is, members of the jury, you judge for yourself. Yeah. You judge, you judge if this is actually true. And we're going to create a link. Lots of times, I'm going to tell you something what happens. Lots of times, you'll have guys. I can't tell you how many cases I have with guys will videotape, particularly the younger ones, yeah. will videotape a beatdown. Why did, because they want to show people that they're real tough and then they'll upload it to social media. Well, no, those, those young men are just asking to go to prison. They, they're they waving <laughs> hands, looking for a ride into Riker. I mean, that, you know, and that's a whole nother level of just young, dumb antics, right? Like they don't even, you know, so, I mean, at least cast, so, so here's the thing, you know, it's come to my attention that 6 9 tried the same thing and was unsuccessful. His attempt was, this is my art. That's not who I am. I shouldn't be, that shouldn't be used against me. Now, end of the day, I don't think it was suppressed and he ended up turning evidence, so he got away anyway. But it just seems patently unfair that the state can use what you do in your artistic career and introduce it into a trial. And likely the people that are listening to this testimony are people from the suburbs, don't know the music, don't know the culture, and taking it tr taking it to heart what you're saying. It just seems extremely, extremely unconstitutional. If they show a pattern, if they can show, so say for example, Chris Hamilton right now is yeah. charged with, I don't know, shooting, right? Yeah. Let's say Chris shot with a shooting someone. He yeah. shot someone, the person didn't die, so shoot. But then it goes to some of Chris's videos, mm -hmm. show him imitating shooting people. Mm -hmm. They're gonna say, well, listen, this is this is Chris's pattern. This is the way he acts. Look at him. He's mm -hmm. shooting in a video. He's mm -hmm. shooting, he's got, he has a gun, although it's fake, but he talks about it. He's imitating life. So as a result, we use this as members of the jury. You decide if it's credible. You decide if it's believable. And but if they got and so there's no attempt, so there's nothing you can do as an attorney in the courtroom to suppress that evidence, to claim that it's, you know, to, to whatever the evidentiary exclusion Value? would be. Yeah, well, there's no, no way to well see here, here's the deal. You the argument to the jury has always been, members of the jury. This the video is exactly what it is. Well, I don't video. want the jury to even see. It. I want before the jury to because when the jury sees it, they can't unsee it, unhear it. So how yeah. do we get prevent it from getting to the jury to begin with? Well, you got to suppress it. You have to ask the judge to suppress it. How do you have to suppress? It? What do we, what do we need to do? Who do we got to? Real pay? difficult. Real difficult. Because the judge is going to say, "Well, it's his video." See, what a couple of things? Is it authentic? Is it him? Is it authentic? Now you can tell the judge it's prejudicial. Judge, it's prejudicial to my client. Well, judge is going to say, well, who the hell made it? Did he make it? Well, then if he uh, made it, then you're going to have to convince the jury that it's this art. It's, it's, it's uh -oh, not like so, uh, so, yeah, so the only way, I think what I'm hearing from you is the only way you're going to get that excluded or precluded is by you telling the judge that it's prejudicial and I did not create it. Someone else did it. And that's for that reason, we can't be trusted. It's not probative of, you know. Well, it's, 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 it's not, we can't authenticate it. We can't, we can't say it's real. So, now, that's problem, get, that, so that's the way to get it out. That's it. Yeah, yeah. No, so that's, that's one way. But remember too now, the prosecutors, the federal government, they've been down this road a thousand times. They're going to say, they, they tap into your cell phone, they tap into your Facebook account, they'll have someone come from Facebook to say that it's a direct, see, they'll have someone come from Facebook and say the following. This is his account. This is his telephone number. This is email. So it's him. Uh, I've had it done. To, I've had it done to me before. They'll just have someone come and uh, say, "Listen, because Facebook is done with what email account, a telephone number." Yeah, okay, yeah. well, that's his email account, a telephone number. It's him. So it's I him. think what you, I think what you're saying, I think the message here, the indirect message is, if you're a gangster in real life, don't portray that gangsterism in the virtual world because well, it will be used against you. If you out, if you really shooting, killing, robbing, raping, selling, okay. But if you don't want to go to crime, if you don't want to go to prison for that, don't put that out there in social media because there's no way you're going to escape that that brand. I tell people all the time, if you if you want to if you want to be a real gangster, and I don't and I don't recommend this to anyone, right? Mm -hmm. But if I had a client, if I had a fictitious client, mm -hmm. and, and 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 he was the way he is, he's a, he's a gangster, he's Whitey Bulger, yeah. right? I would don't post. Anything on Facebook or LinkedIn or Snapchat or TikTok, 
you know, what the expression is real bad boys need to silence. Yeah. Well, there's no reason to post anything. You know, there was a there was a there was a there was a scene out of that movie, uh, Goodfellas, right? And in one scene that, that uh, I forgot who it was called the big boss, and he's telling the big boss something. The big boss says, "I don't ever speak on the phone. If you want to tell me about something, we meet face to face." The moral of that story is, don't speak on the phone. Now, don't, if you're not speaking on the phone, you're, you're damn sure not posting anything on Facebook, on Instagram about how you're blood, you're throwing the gang signs. Don't do it. Mm. Don't do it. I don't know why people do, but don't do it. I, I think I know why they want the nor notoriety, yeah. but with that notoriety comes, you're out there too. Well, you know, you raise an interesting point. I mean, in indirectly, I'm thinking of this, which is you, okay, so you, you practice the gangster antics in social media, and then you bring it to the street and you, you, you live out that, right? You, you know, you're gangster on social media and you're gangster in the street. So it's just a matter of time before you get charged and picked up for something. So that happens. And let's say you, you get slammed with what Casanova's facing. How much money do you need to have under the mattress at your mama's house, stored in the trap house to really defend this kind of prosecution? Because my guess is they throwing, they got it, they got probably teams of lawyers and prosecutors sure. on this dude's case. Probably four or five people at the very least, not to mention investigators and you know paralegals and experts, right? So how much money is it going to take at this level to defend something like this? Well, it comes to it always comes to two two different strategies. Do you want to work out a good deal and plea mm -hmm. or do you want to go to trial? Because those are, those are two different avenues, financial avenues, mm -hmm. because it involves it involves different levels of time. Mm -hmm. Because a trial can last anywhere from God knows eight weeks to, to eight months, and and a plea, you know, you're, you're working and negotiating because you want to cooperate. That's a little less time. Mm -hmm. So we're looking anywhere from twenty thousand upwards to 150, 100, 200 thousand, mm -hmm. because these are very serious charges mm -hmm. involves. A lot of work on the attorney's part because what, what an attorney would have to do is um, not necessarily close his practice down, mm -hmm. but he's going to devote a lot of his time on your case. And, and I always tell clients the following I'm devoting time to your case, but I'm working backwards. Because mm -hmm. remember, when an indictment has already been presented, in other words, the grand jury re returns an indictment, mm -hmm. that means a lot of the work that's been done by the FBI agents already. And then mm -hmm. state investigators. A lot of work. To, so I'm playing catch up. Mm -hmm. I'm coming to you now, turning the client. What did you do? What did you say? Who did you communicate with? Okay, now we're gonna get. So we're gonna start getting these wiretaps. So a lot of work by the by the state, by the federal government, has already been done. Mm -hmm. Remember, when they presented to the grand jury, they came into the grand jury saying, "We want you to return an indictment." Got it. So so now they, now when you return an indictment, it's not re guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a lesser standard, but they still have to have a ton of information. So by the time you finally get the indictment now, a lot of work by the feds or by the state or investigating agents has already been done. Well, let's let's get some clarity on that. What's the relevance of an indictment? Why can't they why can't they just put a warrant out for his arrest, arrest them, and go through the why do they why do they need to incorporate this indictment into this process? Well, they don't really have to. They can, can they arrest you? Pre-indictment, of course they can. They do it all the time. Um, and they can arrest you post-indictment. They what's do it the all the time. What's the benefit of doing it the way they did it, post-indictment? I mean, well, well, they, listen, it's with a sealed indictment. That, it, it says no benefit. I don't see any benefit. Because either way, you're going in. I, um, odds are Casanova is staying in. What's their strategy? What's their, what, what, how does the indictment play into their strategy? Is what I'm well, saying. They, they, build, they build more evidence. You're building more evidence. You build it. You build it. You build it. And sometimes, sometimes, believe it or not, they will have people, your co-defendants, mm -hmm. testify at the grand jury hearings. So a grand jury hearing can last anywhere from one day, damn near two or three months. You know, it just depends how extensive the case is. So they can have, so in other words, say for example, I'm the subject of the indictment. Well, they can have Chris Hamilton testify against me. They can have two or three other guys, they can have my uncle tested, they got people testify against at the grand jury proceedings mm -hmm. to bolster their case. So, so let me ask you this. What is the cast of the legal team likely doing right now? You know, he's already been indicted. He's waiting for the trial. 
What are they literally, what do you think they're doing right now? I'm talking, if I'm there, I'm talking to him. What did you, in, in confidence, mm -hmm. what did you say? Mm -hmm. How much, because there are some of the allegations I heard, and these are allegations, of course, yeah. that he's given some money to one of the higher ups in that blood, blood organization mm -hmm. while he's incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to know from him, is it true? Why'd you give it? Did you give it? Because see, the argument that the government's going to use, he gave the money to this OG, original gangster, or the big homie, or something they call him. He gave it to him in furtherance of a drug trade. But how? I, yeah, that's going to be difficult for them to prove. That's him. That's well, him. You beat that. I gave you know, him money. I gave his mom and his mom to sick. I gave money for, you know, food and for, for medical for his mother. I didn't label it. I just gave him 15, 20 grand to take care of his family. Well, who are you giving who who are you giving it? No, you're not giving the money to the allegations that not that he gave it to his mother and father, but he gave it to this individual in the jail, already incarcerated. Yeah, yeah, because I want to make sure his family gets it. I don't trust that, you know, I gotta give it to the man who 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 I trust. There's no harm. Okay. We, we can beat that, right? We can beat that one, right? Well, well, it depends. Because see, if, if I'm the feds, I'm saying you gave it to him and he gave it to the further his drug trade. Now but that but that's not on me. That's not on me. Unless of course, well, unless of course the money I give them. no, unless of course they got you on wiretap saying you're giving them money for a specific purpose. Okay, so let's say they got they have no audio or written text, anything for me saying I'm giving you money and the person I'm putting money on his head, I'm putting money on this. There's no evidence of that. All you have is me giving the OG 15, 20 stacks because I want to. So we can mm -hmm. beat that. If there's no evidence, sure, then we but can beat that. But if, there, if there's no evidence, then it wouldn't even make it past the grand jury. Well, right. I mean, so, what, so, so what I'm telling you is, trust me, there, there's more evidence than that. I see what you're saying. So they, 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 they got okay. So let's look at the other charge. So let's talk about the racketeering, right? Yeah. So how do we beat that one? What do we do to beat that one? Well, to beat the racketeering, I'm gonna tell you for him, it's gonna be tough, and for most, it's gonna be tough. I'll tell you why. Racketeering is, and believe it or not, racketeering came infamous during the, during the Giuliani days as mayor, as well, I'm mayor, federal, federal, was he mayor? No, you think he was federal prosecutor. Yeah, he was federal prosecutor. It's infamous there because yeah. he used it against John Gotti and company, right? Yeah. Well, and what he essentially said was anybody who even participated, even had knowledge, a link to the head guy, a link to the organization, you're part of the racketeering. Now, you may not be a major player, but you're still part of the racketeering. Or just because... I know this person. More than no, more than no. If you participated in any form or fashion into, into furtherance of what they were doing, racketeering. Yeah, so and, you, gotta and, have, and, you gotta catch my hands, you gotta have my hands gotta be dirty. But if my hands aren't, if I haven't participated by, again, financing a criminal enterprise, engaging in the crime itself, you know, all you have, the most you have is I'm consorting with spending time with the homies who are in who are deal who are in the street doing crime. If that's all you got, we can beat the racketeering charge. Well, let me let me let me let me go back again. When you gave that money, let's say it's Chris Hamilton. Chris Hamilton gave the money to, you know, a guy named Tyrone in jail, right? Yeah. Okay. That's, now. Got a, that's got a presidential. <laughs> can why can't his name be, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Or, or you know, <laughs> okay. Chris Chris Hamilton gives it to Mar Marcus in jail. That's still now, cool, man. Remember the Eddie Murphy movie, Mark Marcus. I mean, people Marcus, <laughs> but let's, let's, how about Tony or okay. Bobby or okay. you know, Jack? Okay, you know, okay. Chris Chris gives the money to 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 Joe Jack. <laughs> okay, okay, go ahead. And, and Joe Jack and Joe Jack now. Mm -hmm. Is and they know Joe Jack is involved in criminal activity, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's going to take Chris and Chris's lawyer to prove that they weren't that you had no knowledge that Joe Jack wasn't involved in criminal activity. But you already know because you and Joe Jack are homies, mm -hmm. right? You and Jack. So if you you and Joe if you and Joe Jack are homies, you know what Joe Jack does. Now it's going to be up to you to prove that I had no knowledge, no clue. Yeah, well, I mean, I know. And by then, yeah. and, by, and by that point, you're already in federal custody. You're already sitting in a jail cell, and you're thinking to yourself, "How the heck do I get myself out of this?" I'm gonna tell. I'm, I'm gonna tell on somebody. See, this goes about full circle. 
I'm stuck in there. My mother's 60 something years old. My girlfriend, she, you know, she needs me. My kid needs me. I'm stuck in jail. I can't provide for no one. In fact, I need someone to provide for me. I really didn't do what they said I did. I'm talking. Mm. I'm going to do some talking. You're caught. Let me ask you this. The, the other two charges they got him on is distributing a controlled substance and possession of fire, firearm um, in, uh, for, in the presence of drug trafficking. So I don't know exactly what the evidence or what the allegation is, whether he had it on his body, his person, or he was in the company of people with these things and in the same car. I'm not really sure, but I'm sure those things do mitigate, right? So for example, if he was in the apartment or home where there was a firearm and there was drugs being, uh, were in possession of people, that in of itself isn't enough to, 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 to convict him on this just because well, sure he's present. Sure why, is that? why is that? Well, cons- there, there are three sorts of conspiracies. Joint, actual, constructive. He may not have actual possession of the gun or firearm, but he, he, but he, sure, he sure the hell got joint and constructive because see, if he knows where the drugs are, Right, so let me. I get. I tell clients this all the time. I got a pen in my hand, and I'm sitting across the table from you. Now, join actual constructive. Actual possession is I got it in my hand. Okay, I'm Chris Hamilton. Does not. You can't find Chris uh, guilty of, of actual because it's not in his hand. But joint possession is if I got it in my hand, it's in the middle of the table. Chris knows it's there. I know it's there. That's joint possession. That's joint possession. So then there was Chris can grab a hold of the pen if he wanted to. So can I. Wait, 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 wait. Are you telling me that I could get in trouble because we're in the same room with an illegal substance? Absolutely. That Absolutely. I had no that I had that I had no involvement in procuring. I didn't bring Absolutely. I didn't bring the brick Absolutely. into the room. I just by being there alone. Uh, listen, let me tell you something. Guys will get stopped in a car. And let's say. Classic example. I say, when I say classic, classic. Chris Hamilton and I are driving in the car. I'm driving the car. Chris is the passenger seat right next to me. Chris has a gun in his possession. He never tells me. I get stopped because I run a red light. Something, traffic, minor traffic violation. Run a red light, headlights, headlights not working. Cops stop us. Cop comes to my side. License, registration, insurance. I hand it over. Cops ask Chris, hey, uh, uh, sir, what's your name? Chris says, well, I'm not giving it to you. Well, Chris, you really can't do that. You're in a car. I can get your license. I can get your name. Not Maybe not your license, but your name. Chris starts giving them a hard time. They say, okay, sir, step out the car. Chris steps out the car. Um, they're talking to Chris. They look, Chris sound, looks a little nervous, a little, little, little sketchy. They said, Chris, we're going to pat you down for what they call officer safety. Yeah. They pat Chris down. Oh, there's a bulge in Chris's well, pocket. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm asking for a supervisor first off, but go ahead, keep going, keep going. No, you know, you're not entitled. You're not, you're, you're not a female. A female can ask for a female to, to frisk her. You're a guy. They touch I'm, you. I'm, what about transgender man? Does that provide me protection? Well, I don't know about all that. <laughs> yeah. See, we gotta, you got to be ready, man. The nuances <laughs> of this game, it is levels. The transgender. Oh, I don't know about the, the transgender. Do your research. Do your research. I don't know about the trans- well, how about this? We'll frisk you first and we'll deal with the consequences of people later. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So you're right. They risk you. They find a gun on you. Now they say, Chris, whose gun is it? Chris says, Well, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. Oh, okay. Since you don't know, Mr. Duclair, I, it doesn't look like your gun, but he's not owning up to it. It's somebody's gun. So, Mr. Duclair, we need you to step out the car as well. And Mr. Duclair, Mr. Duclair, tell us whose gun this is. I don't know. You're going on Chris. Yeah, but Chris is not telling it's, it's it's his. So guess what? Both you guys are coming down to the precinct, and both you guys are getting fingerprint, and both you guys are getting mugshot until someone tells us whose gun. And guess what? If Chris decides not to tell us whose gun it is, we're both going to Rikers. That's correct. Now, now that's just a gun on your person. Forget about the drugs on the table, and Chris is in the same room. Well, wait a minute. Chris, you saw the you saw the drugs on the table. Why didn't you leave? Well, hey, my drugs. I got to do with it. Well, you you're being charged too. This 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 is the perfect label of wrong place, wrong time. All Absolutely, of a sudden, you go do time for the crime. That's Absolutely, ridiculous. that's ridiculous. That seems very unfair. And let me tell you something. There's a story. A couple few over ten years ago, uh, Russell Simmons describes and everybody knows Russell Simmons. 
He's in the car, in his limo, driving around. Sees a buddy of his he hadn't seen in a long time. Buddy gets in the car. They're talking. Russell says the guy looks kind of suspect, like something's wrong. Russ asks him, what's wrong? Guy says, well, you know, I'm, I'm packing something just in case something goes down. Russ says, it's like Russell Sisman said, in case something goes down, what do you mean something goes down? He shows Russell the gun. Russell says, you got to get out of my limo right now. Right here, right now. Gives him money by taxi. At that time, it wasn't an Uber. Gives him money by taxi. You got to get out of the car. Moral of the story, Russell knew if his limo got stopped and the guy gets, and, 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 and you know, everybody gets out of the car for whatever reason, um, Russell's name, even though it's not Russell's gun, his name would be planted on every single paper. New York Post, Daily News, whatever, New York Times, Russell Simmons stopped in the car. Gun found in the car. Because that guy didn't say, well, it was my gun. Because the guy is scared, of course, because he knows maybe his third strike. Maybe he knows if he goes in this time, he's going to go in for a nice stretch. He doesn't want to go in for that. So he's going to buy his time because he's going to wait until he gets a good lawyer that gets, as people say, the gun suppressed. Meanwhile, Russell Simmons is book, fingerprinted, mugshot. Who got time for all that? I see. What and that, that's the problem that you run into all the time. Okay, so let's bring this whole thing full circle, right? And then we're going to bring my law clerk and money, right? So here's my question to you, which is this. So what if, you know, Cass, two times, he's going to stand on his own square. He's not going to cop any pleas. He's not going to give nobody up. He's going to go to trial for all of this. What is the best case scenario and what is the best strategy he can employ to come out of this, uh, you know, without being thrown under, thrown under the jail? Well, it's tough to say without knowing the facts of the case. I mean, I don't have discovery. It's tough to say that. Mm -hmm. um, the best case scenario for him, he gets 10 years or something or something even lighter than that. If, if he does what they call, uh, 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 he, he talks. The worst case scenario for him, he'll spend the rest of his life in jail. Cass, Cass has prior convictions, which makes him some, what they call habitual offender. Mm -hmm. So he'll spend the rest of his life in jail. Um, Best case scenario, he goes to trial, he beats it. I, you know, there's so many different, the you know, federal government and the prosecutors, everyone likes to throw all the stuff on the wall. Because the concept is, the more stuff you throw on the wall, something's going to stick. Mm. And if you're with, and if you're with, see, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're on trial with a bunch of bad, bad guys, jurors tend to look at that and go, well, okay, you may not be with them, but you're with them right now. You might have done something too because you're with these really bad, bad guys. Yeah. So you did something as well. So the best case, I mean, listen, there's a reason the federal government and even state government, there's like a 95% or 90% plea rate mm -hmm. because you end up pleading guilty. It's, it's stacked against you because, you know, the best criminal is a criminal that does look, that, that looks so inconspicuous, you would never know he's a criminal. And where's the fun of that? Who wants to be that kind of criminal? You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. You everybody want to be the tatted up, you know, right, get, right. Get it. Then you get your credit, then you get your props, right? So uh, that, that, that's the problem. That's the problem. You gotta pay because you make your, you make yourself a, you make yourself a target. Yeah, one way or another, you're gonna be paying the price for that, right? Yeah. All right, all right. Well, let's bring Amani in to ask you some questions. I'm gonna give her a second to join us. All right, brother. So, Mr. Duclair, Counsel Duclair, you know, attorney extraordinaire, I have here my very, very sagacious, uh, you know, inspiring law clerk who is ready to ask you some questions that hopefully um, will, will, will shake you up a little bit and give you some trouble. <laughs> so, go ahead, Amari. What do you got? Yeah. So, um, one of the things that I kind of wanted to mention was you, you talked about how, like, you know, real gangsters kind of really move silently. Like you essentially have to, if you are trying not to get caught up. Um, I wonder then what's your take on the fact that, you know, social media is literally what funnels like a lot of people's um, paychecks, their livelihood, especially, you know, celebrities. It's, it's, it's a vital part of their whole territory. Um, what are some things in that you would say to someone who is, you know, a rapper who, um, you know, maybe even an actor it has prior criminal history, but like now they thrive on the, you know, the use of social media because it helps boost their overall 
celebrity? Um, does that mean that they're always going to constantly be under, you know, I mean, yes, the public eye, but I mean, the, the government's eye, if that's the case, because it almost seems like anything can be used as evidence against them, if that's the case. That's a great question. Well, you know, I, 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 think, I think the question you're asking is, if you want to be a famous, if you want to be, if you want to continue to be a rapper and promote this sort of violent activities, gangster activity, um, can you still do it and be in social media and be and, and not and not become in the crosshairs of any federal or state agency? The answer to that question is no. If you want to be a famous, if you, if if your perception, you know, and I know this this new generation, this rap thing, they want to be gangster, everything tough to be gangster, but tied up in the face, they want to look like Lil Wayne, tied it up, things of that nature. Um, you put yourself out there. There's good with that and there's bad with that. And if you want to portray yourself like that, be expected to have the bad. The bad becomes a lot of scrutiny. And lots of times you will find um, when people who want to do such a thing, they have this entourage, right? You know, you know I can't stress enough. If you want, if, if you, you know, if you want to be a gangster rapper, then you need to surround yourself with a bunch of lawyers and a bunch of publicists that can that can make sure that you're never in some sort of trouble. Yeah. Because I'm gonna tell you something. Once you want to be this gangster on the street and tatted up, neck all over the place, and talk talk that talk, um, you have a tendency to want to hang with people who actually walk that walk. And give you that validity, give you that credibility. Correct. Right. All right. Now, now you now you look at Takashi Six Nine, right? Mm -hmm. It's my understanding he never had that, so he aligned himself with some bloods. Okay. Next thing you know, he's getting caught up in something. Because it, the way the story goes, the bloods act, after a while didn't really try to throw him to the curb, and he and they try to do certain things to him, and now he gets caught up, in, and he tried to he in turn does something to them, he gets caught up in something. Right. So so you know you want to if, if you want to be a gangster rapper, you want to portray that moved by part of the bloods or the Crips or the, or some of the uh, Latin kings. That, you can do that. You can do that, and you want to be authentic, to be real with it. You can do that, but know know what that comes with. That comes with constant scrutiny because remember, it's not you that that does the that does the, the, the act. It's usually your man, your partner, your boy, blah blah blah. Somewhere down the line, he does it. But remember, you're part of that organization. Yeah, yeah. So now it comes right back to you. They, when the feds hit, when the feds or any state agency hits you, they're grabbing everyone. They're grabbing everyone. So you don't want to be. You really do not. You don't want to be part of that. Like you said, you know, just because you sat in the room. With the brick of cocaine, that's enough, right? So it's more than enough. It is if you're gonna be a rapper and be thugged out as a rapper, but don't want to do time or get implicated in anything, then it sounds to me like you have to be faking it, right, in social media all the time, and then never be around the dudes who are really living that life if you're gonna survive. Or like we talked about before, is these labels, you're investing so much in these artists, and you know, you're generating so much money from their success, spend a little much, spend a little more money, have a budget allocated to basically chaperone them with two or three men or women who are gonna protect them from that world. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. kind of put them like basically they're like a uh, they're like a, a, a hedge of protection around them. So like no matter what nightclub you go to, no matter what hood, you know, whatever what trap you at, when they see danger or criminal liability, they say we need to move. Right, and that right. you can always avoid. But that's no fun, right? It's more fun pops popping a bottle and knocking someone upside the head with a bottle than it is leaving the scene when things get get thick. Well, here's the other, here's the other problem you run into. You can't even fake be a gangster because once you start fake become a gang, what do you you're either you're either going to do one or two things: claim a blood or claim a crip or claim something. Once you start claiming that as a rapper, the real ones are going to say, "Well, no, you're not." They're going to test you. They're going to test yeah. you. So you're always gonna have a problem. So there's really no win. There's really no win. No, no. There's no the, win. The, the, the no win is, is to be. I'm a Christian. Be be an R and B singer, right? <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> or be, or be a pop. Be a, you know what's that? What's the what's the Asian group? Uh, K-pop. 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 Be a K-pop singer. <laughs> and, 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 in this day and age, everyone everyone who goes not everyone, a lot who go into rap has some affiliation with a gang. There's some affiliation. 
either they were part of it or they they got um, they, there's some affiliation that mm -hmm. leads into that could lead you into some trouble. Well, here's the other uh, other side. I don't want to I'm going to each other take questions, but I want to just lay this in, lay this out there because this is something that I have to talk about. The ugly reality of all of this is this: if you want to be in the music business, even as an R&B singer, but especially as a rapper, and not be extorted. You need to have you need to have strength in the streets, right? You need to have you need to have you need to be strong in the street. Otherwise, you end up being extorted and exploited by those that presence that permeates the business. So the reality is this: if you want to be a thugged out rapper or just be a B2K, whatever, you still gotta have people out there that's willing to put in the work to protect you from the wolves. There's no such thing as Oh, I'm going to come in here and make my music, make my money, make my millions and live a fancy, incredible life. No, that's not going down. Because when the corporate parents go away and when all of the suits are gone, the wolves come out to your show. They come to your video, uh, to your recording session, your studio session. They will find you and extort you if you don't have your own wolves, right? So it's kind of a, a catch-22, which no one really talks about. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, so Amani, any other questions for? No, yeah. Um, I mean, I just have one more follow-up one, but I mean, even to what you just mentioned, um, kind of a comment is, so it kind of seems like when you're making a decision, whether you forego your street life or you forego money, because I mean, you know, uh, the music business is really, the art is the imitation of the lifestyles that a lot of these rappers, you know, um, come from. And so in a sense, it's like, they kind of have to make a, a game time decision. It's like, do I continue on and become just this, you know, gangster rapper? But now I'm, you know, opening myself or exposing myself to all this potential like lawsuits. Um, or do I, you know, leave behind the life of crime, try to go on the straight and narrow. But then, like you said, now I got to hope that everybody back home doesn't, you know, find a way to come out and get me as well. So it's really like a rock in the hard place for them yeah, because situation. you got to figure it out. I mean, that's the, the business is really what, like, that's what makes the business thrive are, are these, you know, interesting stories and, you know, how people were able to overcome certain things and the violence, because like, to be honest, like there's an obsession that people have with violence when they're not the ones committing it. They love to hear these stories. And, you know, that is what rap is storytelling. So it, it's hard. Um, Cause it sounds like you essentially are foregoing a whole bag, like of money, you know, to, kind of try to be on the straight and narrow, hope that you can be successful that way, but then you only have a one one time hit, you're screwed. So yeah. it's hard. It sounds yeah. very difficult. You know something, I, it, it, I'm watching these young rappers today um, and there's an expression, um, you know, first of all, not all rappers right now are coming through the, the, the gang affiliation, not all. You know, there, there's right. some, there's right. some that are, and, and you know, quite frankly, it's not their fault because remember, these young guys are coming in, they commit a crime, they go to Rikers, okay? Or they go to state, some state prison. In state prison, they need some help because nobody wants to be left alone. They get involved in the gang. Yeah. But fundamentally, the, the Bloods and Crips, at the very onset, they were there for some good. Mm -hmm. Things, things, yeah. things yeah. went things went left and right really, really badly. Okay, fine. So when you go to, so when you go to these prisons, you come out, you need some help, you're being helped. When you, when you come out now, you're indebted. You're indebted, and you're indebted, and you and you and you really hold true to that debt because you were being protected while you went state prison. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So now you come out, you owe a debt, and you want to honor that debt. Yeah. And you know it's very, it's real difficult, and I can I, just, I represent guys in gangs. Repeat. All, I mean, a lot of my clients are in gangs, and I try to say, well, can you get out? And there's expression, blood in, blood out. So. Mm -hmm. They can't really get out. They're, they're in. They're in. Some do get out. I mean, don't get me wrong. They get out, but yeah. it's not as easy as you think it is because they built. They actually built a bond. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They built a real, real bond with yeah. guys. It's. It's. I think it's a real complex issue that no one's really examining on a deeper level. Uh, the idea that, I mean, one is a relationship we talked about where you have this family dynamic all, along with the consequences of severing ties with your family, whether it's the emotional strain or whether it's the reality of someone coming after you. But then you got this other dynamic which someone talks about, which is like Imani was saying, here you are, you suffered pain growing up, you use it to create stories and tell stories about your pain and, and create an, an avenue for you to take care of yourself and feed your family and change your life, right? But the truth seems to be, I say seems, because I'm, I'm sure there's some exceptions, 
But the consistent theme is that these stories are like self-fulfilling prophecies over and over and over again. So it's like, okay, yeah, I sold drugs, you know, I, I, I did, committed a murder, I got, I got sliced, I got sash, and my life was crazy, and I made a dope song about it, and I made some money. But then you end up either going in back into that life, whether, you, whether you're the victim of that, you know, aggression, or you bring about that aggression on someone else. So end of the day, I don't, I question whether or not that is even really the avenue to like free yourself from that bondage of that world, right? Because it's like basketball. It's like only a small, you got a, you got a ton of brilliant players or whatever the sport is, but only a small percentage make it to the pros. I think rap is the same way. Only a small percentage make it past the, the, the level that the um, that you know Casanova was in, and other people, Bobby Schmurda, all these other pop smoke. These they at that mid level where they almost about to blow it to the whole level, like or the fifty level. But there's but they ain't that many TIs holds fifty. There's not that many. So what happens is the vast majority of them get the bag, get the fame, but they flame out quick because of crime, jail, yeah. I mean, crime, um, death, or something else, right? So it's almost like is that even like a practical path? if you are brilliant and creative, you know what I'm saying? Because the, the consequence you're going to pay, using that yeah. as a leverage point. You know, sometimes, sometimes, there, there, there are two names that come to mind. Um, you may not, I don't remember, one's called Shine, yeah. the other one's called uh, C, uh, C Murder. C Murder is out of, yeah. he out of... Um, no Limit. No Limit. Now, yeah. you know, it, sometimes you can't take, take them out of that that, that C murder gets caught up in some, his brother does is doing exceptionally well, yeah, Master yeah. P exceptionally well. I mean, a big businessman, but you know, you can't, you want to be part of that, that crowd. You can't, I'm trying to get you out of there because I know it's because see what's going to happen is you're going to go there, something special, something's going to kick off. You're going to want to pull out your, it's going to happen. You want, I want to get you oh, out wait, of that. Murder. Go ahead, keep going. See, yeah, right. Yeah. 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 I, I, I want to get you out of that. You know, and you can't shine. Same thing, bad, uh, uh, bad boys. Here yeah. he is out there in the club, allegedly pulls out a gun and shoots him. I mean, you want to get, I want to get you out of that bad boy mentality and more into the business mentality. It's the mentality, but it's also the environment because see murder and shine. I'm sure they both would say that they were doing the right thing. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. Now, if sure. he didn't have the hammer on him, that's the shine. There would have been nobody to shoot, right? But the other side of it is, if he didn't have the hammer on him, he might have suffered the loss of his own life, right? Well, yeah, so, and that's true. And that, but here's the thing, though. The thing they always say, um, there, there's an expression this judge used to always tell me, not me, but tell uh, uh, my clients, juvenile mm -hmm. judge. He said, you know, I know where you're going to be in five years by who you're hanging with today. Facts. Facts. Stop hanging with these Facts. guys. You know. Uh, up to no, you know they're up to the, they're your boys. I I get it. Your, I get it. But stop hanging with them because you're gonna end up just like them or even dead. Yeah, I think you uh, listen. You're 100 right. And you bring this to a close. I think you're 100 right about that. I think the challenge though is that with young men who are lacking, you know, a, a figure, adult figures who identify with, and are lacking a, a, a familial environment of support. That's all that they have. Not making excuses for them, but I understand it to some degree. Like. It's just, it's just so many layers and it's just so complex and it's so messy that, you know, it's, it's, it really needs something needs to be done about it. But listen, man, I appreciate you jumping on the, the jack with us and talking about these relevant issues. Imani, and thank you so much for the work and country she put in research-wise and, and the questions you asked. And I think that this other sad truth of it is there will probably be many more people to talk about in the weeks sure. to come, maybe even days to come. These rappers are, are dropping like flies, whether it's, again, you know, criminal indictments and charges or whether they're getting murdered or shot or whatever. So it's crazy. So let's definitely regroup and, and, and do some more of this, you know? Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was a pleasure, man. It was a pleasure. I'm going to sign out. Listen, if you like this post, make sure you subscribe to Brooklyn Boardroom. Find me on Instagram, BKLYM Boardroom. Uh, subscribe, like, forward, share. All we're trying to do is share the knowledge and, uh, and be smart as we move out here in these streets. You know what I'm saying? Keep it, keep it 100. All right, deuces. Thank you, man.